Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back with another episode of Fireside Chat, and this is our post-playoff edition of the show. And as usual, I'm here alongside Matt. How are you feeling today, buddy? Good. And we have a special guest with us today. Uh, Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, hello. This is uh, Kevin Olenek. I have my own podcast. We uh, It's called Agree or Disagree, the podcast. We've had Dan and Matt on the show a couple of times. Uh, I talk about religion, politics, sex, and everything else. And the Flames certainly label into religion. And so we're looking forward to chatting this up and reviewing the year. Yeah, we've been on Kevin's show a couple of times, so we figured we'd get Kevin on our show. And uh, it's always good chatting with Kevin and getting a different perspective on the team. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. So we talked, uh, Matt and I, last time after Game 3, which was the big... Uh, 4-3 win for the Flames. And after that, the Flames didn't fare so hot in this series. We had uh, the game on Friday where they lost 4-2, to two, and then the 3-2 to two loss on Sunday, which effectively ended the Flames' season uh, in a five-game series. Matt, what were your thoughts on the final two games of the series? I thought the Flames played well at times, but it seemed like as the games went on, they were just running out of gas physically and like they weren't as sharp as the game progressed. Like they got out to leads in both games, but they just allowed Anaheim to take over and come back. Kevin, what were your thoughts? Uh, I really thought they had an opportunity in game four. I thought they needed game four to even have a shot. Uh, it was, uh, they had the two-man advantage. They didn't get it done in the third period. Uh, Colburn took that bad penalty. Uh, that sank them. What would have been really nice uh, would have been the win in Anaheim to get that monkey off the bat. Even if they played tonight and they lost the series, I think people would have, obviously people were okay with it, but I think getting over the hump of beating Anaheim at, in Anaheim at some point would have, would have helped psychologically. I think it they really affected them in game five. Uh, I just thought even even that the start when Calgary was dominating, you can see Anaheim was starting to take over because they just simply have the confidence to do that. No, I, I agree with you. I think there were definitely chances in game four where the Flames could have come back, um, could have potentially taken the game over. If you look at the shots in Game 5, it was 47 shots for Anaheim versus 19 shots for Calgary. I think by that point, I don't want to say they'd given up, but I think maybe they knew that they were just outpowered by the Ducks because that wasn't a great game in my opinion. Well, the thing is that they had 11 shots in the first period, so in the remaining 43 minutes of the game, they only had 8 shots. Yeah, there was at one point John Down uh, posted on Twitter uh, breaking the Flames got a shot on goal, and that was in the third period. So it would just, it, it just really what I think from game one, what struck me was this is the Flames were playing their big brothers and what they're building to become a strong three line team with good depth on defense and solid goaltending, not spectacular goaltending, but solid goaltending. And a pretty players, pretty much a player's coach uh, that you end up learning to love. Uh, Bob Hartley and Bruce Brodeur are very similar. They're kind of like your uncle. Uh, very much kind of Brian Burke style teams, ironically. So I, I, you know, I don't think the loss that hard. I think that this is the team that we're building towards, right? So that's a good way to look at it. And if you listen to the interview on the Flames website as well with uh, Hartley and Treliving. There was a lot more guys hurt than we thought, and I think that's probably a big reason why they might have uh, fallen flat so early as well. Boma was out for a while. and They were even mentioning that Hoodler was playing hurt. Um, Brody was playing hurt. Like A lot of the top guys weren't at, phys at peak physical condition. Yeah, and like if you look at the last two months of the season uh, since Giordano went down, you had Brody, Russell, and Weidman playing pretty much 30 minutes every other day 
And that does get to you after a while. And especially in the first round, uh, the sixth defenseman was only playing four to six minutes a night until Diaz returned. So, like, it made it even more difficult and challenging. It just looked like they were getting burnt. Yeah, and they didn't even play. Diaz played, what, five eight, five to eight minutes game five, I think. They had him down. They, so they were still rolling with four or five defensemen even at that point. And Derek England's not a top four defenseman. I think we can all agree on that. And, you know, maybe we they were playing over their head in a lot of ways. Like, just that, it was just that much desperation. It just took over. Yeah, I'm um, just checking the time on ice. Diaz had five and a half minutes. All even strength time, too. Yeah. And so, I mean, and how much Watherspoon played very little in this series. Um, yeah, it, it you have a team that's mostly healthy versus a team that's basically got everybody walking wounded. It, you know, it, it's disappointing that they lost, but when you have Monaghan, who couldn't win a face-off because of injuries... And, like, the whole team's just deflated because they're trying to fight through whatever their own injury was. It makes it a lot more challenging. Yeah, I think that's it. It wasn't just trying to take on the Ducks. It was trying to take on whatever they've already got. Um, You know, these injuries, these ailments. And then also trying to take on one of the best teams in the NHL all at the same time. I think that the Flames probably just ran out of gas. Yeah. Yeah, and that was bound to happen, really. I mean, that was bound to happen for sure. And all the comebacks, I mean, even Game 6 was a comeback from 3 nothing in the first round. Game 3 was a comeback late. I mean, they've had to play hard all year. You know, so Anaheim had an opportunity to rest at some point during this year, right? And so, and even the long layoff. I mean, Anaheim won 4 nothing over the Jets they swept the Jets but still I, I think that that rest I think the, they were the more rested team and you can clearly see that the more confident team Kevin is there any shame to you in going out to the Ducks no not at all not at all as I said I think I think I, there there are big brothers right now I I'm, I'm not embarrassed I the only thing is I I wish they would have won one game in Anaheim I think that would have really helped next year now that monkey is still on their back but I think it's something that they can grow towards. I, I hopefully early, they get Anaheim early in the year and they can get that out of the way. I think that that's going to be one of the more important things for next year is winning at least one game in Anaheim, maybe even two, because they will be our path to getting out of this division no matter what, right? So yeah, I think I think the Ducks will be dominant for a few years here, and if you want any success in the West, you're going to have to go through them. Well, yeah. the thing is that if you look at the teams that are in our division and how the playoffs are set up, LA and Anaheim are basically the same team structurally. Anaheim's, of course, the better team, but in the playoffs, it, it will likely be matching up with one or both of those teams. So the Flames will need to adapt to playing against such a large, fast skating team. Yeah. Yeah, and they have a lot of depth, too, and that's the thing that really showed. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, Corey Perry was unbelievable in Game 5, but Matt Bolesky was something else. Um, you could clearly see the difference between a Ryan Kessler team and a Ryan Kessler t- non-Ryan Kessler team in the two rounds, couldn't you? Um, I bet, bet you Vancouver would want Kessler back, but just a, that's a de- depth team, depth on defense, this scary young defense, too. And a pretty solid goalie. So, and you're not going to win with eight shots in two periods on a goalie like that. It's very true, Matt. Any other thoughts about this series? No, just they played well uh, as well as they could have. You just know that personnel-wise, that that this team wasn't exactly a good matchup for Anaheim. And then injuries and all that on top made it even more difficult. But at least the Flames get to see what it takes to be a cup caliber team. So the thing I think, you know, and you kind of mentioned this, that we weren't built, you know, to beat Anaheim. And I think that's the big thing is we weren't built to be a playoff team. Anaheim was. We got, I I, I don't want to, you know, throw the word around too much, but we got lucky that we were there. 
And I think that's the big thing. If we were built to be a Stanley Cup contending team, I think that we could have taken the Ducks with, you know, six, seven games. But this was not a team built to go deep. Right. Well, I mean, if Michael Furland's three years older, if Joel Corbin has two more years of experience, if Lance Boma's healthy, if Mark Giordano, if Gio's healthy, I think this might be a different series. But that's the reality is, is that didn't happen, right? Um, and Michael Furland was hurt too, wasn't he? Yeah. If you look at uh, the team that plays Anaheim next, Chicago, that's basically what the style of team that the Flames are heading into. So... Like, if you're talking about, like, a veteran-laden squad, well, once our players get more experience, we'll start to look more and more like Chicago does now. So it'll be interesting to see how they fare against Anaheim in the next round, so that way the Flames can take lessons from what they're doing as well in terms of roster setup to see if, if they're able to beat them and why or why not. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I think I do see a lot of I see a lot of Chicago in this team. I see I can kind of compare Monahan to Taze, sort of the same side of a player, Goudreau to Kane. Um solid defense. Uh I mean Geo Seabrook, Geo Duncan Keith really, Brody, I mean I mean not that Brody is Seabrook, but Brody's going to get there, right? Um so yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, really, in my opinion, it doesn't matter who comes out of the East. I think the winner of this series will win the Stanley Cup, in my opinion. So, Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, the only team that I could see possibly winning from the East is the Rangers, and that's only because of Henrik Lundqvist, because he could easily steal a series himself. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's Chicago or Anaheim. And that's the thing. I mean, we're in a, we're in a conference where really two of the – there's going to be some, I mean, LA will be back. San Jose will likely be better next year, I'm assuming. So it's a good, it's a good learning test either way for the, for this team. Right. So. Well guys, why don't we move away from the second round and kind of recap, uh, this season, Matt and I did a little bit of that after the regular season, but, uh, Earlier this year in the postseason or in the preseason, sorry, we were on Kevin's show talking about predictions, and we were also making predictions here on our show. I uh, thought I'd go over some of the predictions we made here and how we fared on them. This will look bad. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, not, yeah. It, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. Okay. So we were talking about the coaching. We were talking about the front office and if there are going to be any changes there with Hartley being in his last year of his contract. Um, as of now, the assistant coaches are not re-signed, but Trilliving has said that that's a priority. So we had predicted no changes are going to be made in the office, and I guess that would also be your coaching staff, and we were right on that one. We had Trilliving come in, and he retained the coach. Yeah, yeah, he, it's true, and probably the probably the Jack Adams Awards winner, I would think. I think if it's not, there's something going on in head office. Yeah. There's a conspiracy of some kind, for sure. So, Matt, we're one for one so far. Uh, Better than I thought. <laughs> we we took we had three players who we thought were going to move out of Calgary this year. Uh, the first one we got right was Curtis Glencross. I think that was a given. Yeah. The second one we thought was going to be Brian McGradden. I'd say I'll give us half a point for that because he's technically not in Calgary, but he's still in the Flames organization. What do you think, Matt? Well... They, they did kind of banish him to Adirondack for the the second half of the year, and uh, he didn't even play in February or March. So I'd give it three quarters of a point. I'll give you point seven five. All right, you can be you can be our official impartial auditor, Kevin. Exactly. And the third guy was Dennis Weidman. Before the season started, we thought that Weidman was on his way out, and I'm pleased to announce that we got this one wrong. I think Weidman's really stepped up and had a great season this year. Well, the thing with Weidman prior to this year is that he was always a defensive liability. Like, if you look back when he was with Washington, they sheltered him like Tampa did with Marc-Andre Bergeron. And... It coming into this season, nobody saw him magically developing a strong, solid defensive game, but he managed. And he, not only did he have a career year in terms of points, but he also was very good as a number four defenseman 
in his own zone. I thought he was actually better once Gio went down. I thought I thought his I think I mean he was solid all year, but I thought after the injury to Gio, I thought that's when his that's when we, the last twenty games was some of his best best he played. I agree with you, but I don't think he could have kept that pace up for eighty two. No, oh no. I think Gio Absolutely. got injured. Yeah. I don't want to say at the right time, but Gio got injured with an amount of time that Weidman could handle that role. Yeah, I I I think that. Uh, Wyman can give you that top for about maybe 30, 40 games, but I don't think he's an 80 game. Yeah, I I, I would agree with you there. So we we saw from Weidman especially, um, he got benched early in the year, and we really saw him change his game after that. That's the same thing we saw with Goudreau when he got benched early in the year and then changed. Um, do you guys think that it's Weidman finally showing us that he can be a, I guess, I don't want to say premier defenseman, but a core guy, or do you think it's Bob Hartley able to get more out of him than anyone else has before? What do you think, Kevin? I think it's a bit of both. He's got a lot of talent. I've always liked him. I thought I've always liked his game, um, but I thought Hartley brought out. I think last year, last season, he wasn't interested. And I think that's why, and I remember on your show, that's why and I quote, Weidman, get your Weidman here. Uh, remember that. But he, there wasn't a lot of, he didn't play with a lot of interest. He didn't play with a lot of passion. Uh, I think that a lot of Flames fans notice that. And I think that's what, um, I, I think that's what got, uh, uh, what Hartley got out of him. He's got him, like, there was like a passion and an interest to pl- play here and like a pride to wear the Flames jersey. I, I, that's what I, I think. So I think a little bit of both, but I think if I had to tilt it one way, I'm going to give it to Hartley because I think he, he cre- Hartley and the team created an opportunity to him to play with some identity. Matt, do you think we see the same Dennis Weidman next year, or do you think he'll go back to being the Dennis Weidman we've seen in the past? I think that he's learned how to be an a two-way defenseman that's good at both ends like he's always had the good slap shot and like could put up 40 50 points no problem but his defensive game has always been lacking and whatever magic bob hartley wove with him it, it seems to have worked and i would be more cautiously optimistic that he will re- retain those abilities heading into next year yeah, I agree. And realistically, like if it, he had been playing as well as he did this season, nobody would have ever wanted him being moved at all. Right. Is isn't he unrestricted next year, or is he unrestricted this year? I uh, I do know he has one more year mm-hmm. at least. Yeah, he's not a UFA this uh, this summer. Let me look it up and see. But yeah, I think that, I mean, when we talked on Kevin's show, uh, we talked about having Weidman in a fire sale just to get rid of the, just to get rid of the contract. And now I think after this year, if Weidman were to be moved, which I'm not in favor of right now, I think that we could actually get a good piece for him. Yeah. He's got two years remaining. Yeah. And he's, he's making five and uh, five and a quarter this year and 6 million next year. Yeah. That's solid. Yep. Um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. I it's well. I think we'll we'll get into this probably a little bit later, but it depends on where we are next year as well. I think too. Yeah. Right? But the the last set of predictions that Matt and I made at the beginning of the year that I wanted to call back was uh, we thought the Flames were going to be f- bringing home a lot of hardware this year. We're expecting a lot of awards from the award show. Um, let's run through the three that we thought the Flames would take home. We expected uh, the captain, Mark Giordano, to take home the Norris Trophy. I'll ask both of you guys. I'll start with our guest. If Mark Giordano did not get hurt, do you think he would get the Norris nom? Uh, I hands down. Yeah, I, I think he's he's a heart nom if if he's still playing. I'd have to agree with Kevin there. The second one we thought we would see was the Calder Trophy for Johnny Goudreau. Matt, what do you think about that one? He, that was not really much. As long as Goudreau remained healthy, I figured that he was going to win that one. And I mean, away. we weren't even sure at the time if Goudreau was going to make the team or be here all year. So yeah, I think that was contingent on Goudreau playing like 50 games. 
Yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I mean, I was excited, but I didn't want to put a Calder expectation on him. So uh, I'm pleasantly surprised by that. I hope he wins it. I don't know if he will, but we'll. I guess we'll see. And the last one, which I think now you might as well just hand the man the trophy right now. We all expected that Bob Hartley, if he could get this team not to be at the bottom of the league, would probably get the uh, Jack Adams trophy. Do you guys think there's any question right now that he walks away with Jack Adams? Uh, who else is nominated? Lavia Lett and uh, Vigneault. He should win it, I think. I think he should win it out of the three. I, uh, um, there's that Eastern bias, so it could go to Vigneault because he, the Rangers had one of the best records, but it should be Hartley. Yeah, the, Hartley did the most with the least heading into this season. Like, everybody looked at the Flames on paper, and I think we both said, like, 29th, 30th. Dan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were expecting that we'd probably be battling Edmonton for last in the West. Um, you know, I think, and I've said this on the show before, if you look at the coaches around the league, I think for a lot of the successful teams, the coaches are interchangeable. You know, you could have pretty much any NHL coach coach a team like the Rangers and probably get them the same place. You could probably have a lot of different coaches coach the Ducks and get them the same place. I think that Hartley was directly responsible for where the Flames got. Yeah, I I, I, I totally agree. Uh, especially after Gio went down, I think we all thought the playoffs were – it was a great run, but unfortunately not this year. Uh, I mean – the amount of comebacks this year. We, I mean, we even came back from four nothing at one point. Uh, the goaltending, uh, which we'll probably get into in a couple of segments, I think, uh, and even the injuries to goaltending. Uh, lots, lots happened, right? I mean, Matt, any other, uh, any other kind of comments? Anything you want to say about our predictions? Well, it wasn't quite as bad as I was expecting. Other than our predictions for where the flames would end up, but but you yeah. know I'm I'm glad that one is wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, same here. And I think if we were as crazy as Aaron Ward and we said that we would be in the playoffs uh, this year, I don't think many people would still be listening. No, <laughs> you have to be cautiously optimistic when making predictions, and the Flames had a lot of ifs and maybes heading in, like if Monaghan plays as good as last year, so on and so forth, it, everything pretty much went Calgary's way. And, it, you know, that's a, more the exception than the norm. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we take a, lo a look back at the season that was? We've done this a little bit already, but um, I'll start with Kevin. Kevin, is there? what do you think we will look back at this season and remember as the good? The things that when we look back at 2014, 2015, we're going to remember as the positives. Uh, I Well, we'll start backwards. I think clinching game six in the first round, uh, coming back from 3 nothing. I think that that'll be a memorable moment. Uh, how we won game three. Well, that's this is not backwards in Anaheim. Uh, making the playoffs and all the comebacks, I think. I think all the comebacks this year, I think, made it uh, even more mem more memorable than it was usual. a fun I mean, season to watch Flames hockey, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the way that Monahan, Goudreau, and Hoodler played this year, uh, Hoodler was in the top, got into the top ten of scoring. Uh, I mean, and even a nice story, too, like Matt Stajan scoring the game-winning goal in Game 6. I think that that just was fitting for all that he went through personally. Uh, and if so many people wanted him out of here, uh, and, you know, just another glue guy. Uh, I think uh, Michael Ferkland, I mean Furland, uh, making a name for himself. What do you mean making a name for himself? I think I thought he was irrelevant. Oh, uh... He might have been to a certain number three for Vancouver, but I think he made himself very relevant. Uh, but just, I think the character of this team, I think is the thing that I think people will look back and remember. And I think that that's what people appreciate it is maybe not a lot of talent, but uh, there was a lot of effort every night. There wasn't rarely a night. Was there a bad night on this, this year? Matt, what about you? What are your memories going to be of this season? The never-say-die attitude. That 
for me, going away, that is the entire emblematic description of the Calgary Flames. Never so, quit. That year. was their slogan. Yeah. And no matter how far down they were, how downtrodden things got, like in November, they lose their top three centers. And, you know, they had to shoehorn Monahan into the first line role, and he took it off running, and just so many odd surprises. Like, it, whenever the Flames were down and out, they just seemed to find a way to fight back into it. From losing the centers, Giordano going down at the end of the year, losing eight games in a row. No matter what adversity they faced, they just found a way to push through it. Yeah, for me this year, I think the things I'm going to remember are one, I think, will be Bob Hartley. I mean, if we look back at the 04 run, not a lot of people look back and say, wow, Daryl Sutter was a key to that team, even though, you know, arguably he was. I think that Bob Hartley is the biggest one this year and what he was able to get out of these players. I've said it before, but even if not by numbers, I can't think of a player who didn't have a career year this year. I think everyone played the best hockey we've ever seen from them. Yeah. I mean, David Jones was, was relevant this year. Exactly. And yeah, most people thought like he was just destined to be like a press box guy until we can burn his contract out. Well, and, and even look at a guy like Josh Juris, right? I mean, a guy who was low on the depth chart, a guy nobody thought would stick around here all year. You know, a guy like uh, Corey Potter or even a David Schlemko who nobody else in the league wanted, and they came here and they excelled. And I think that it's going to be a year, I remember, of everybody doing what they needed to do to win. And so, the wins weren't always pretty. The wins were sometimes ugly. But we managed to get them. And and I think, too, looking back at not only the team, but the fans. The Sea of Red, especially during the playoffs, how stoked everybody was for this team. It's reinvigorated the passion for the Flames here in this city. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I also think, too, one thing that I think was kind of forget you talked about Schlemko that was a smooth pickup but getting two second round picks for Curtis Glencross was far more than I think anyone imagined we would have gotten for Curtis Glencross who was uh, incidentally at times a healthy scratch for Washington since he was there and I don't feel like we missed Curtis Glencross here at all I don't think I don't feel like if we had Curtis Glencross it would have made a huge difference in my opinion no I don't think so yeah, well, that's part of a team. How like how you build a team is selling off assets when they're not really necessary, and you have a player that can step in and take that role. And like moving ahead to next year, a guy like David Jones, who's on the last year of his contract, he might similarly be expendable and being replaced by a guy like Drew Shore. So it's just rolling over the assets and getting more draft picks so you can get more guys and hopefully turn things over. Um, a great quote, we were just talking about the Sea of Red, a great quote from Johnny Goudreau during his eggs interviews is he said, I've never seen people so passionate about hockey. It's like, well, Johnny, welcome to Calgary because this is, this is the Sea of Red. But, you know, I think, I think that without the Sea of Red – all of us, you know, the three of us on the line right now, everyone listening to the show and everyone who put on a red jersey this year, I think that we were that sixth man on the ice or that seventh man if you count the goalie. Uh, you know, I think that our energy really helped the Flames and pumped the Flames up. And when you know the fans are into it, you're going to play harder. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. If we had been like a library in round one, I don't think the Flames get past vancouver even which their years the dome has been known to be like the library yeah i mean i mean we did make the make the playoffs a couple of years in between and we weren't that loud or that excitable right so yeah we've had that reputation of being a, for the most part a library set of fans but this year this year was different for sure you know i i went to game six of the first round here at the dome and my ears were ringing for two days afterwards like i've Same never here. had that when i left a hockey game yeah, that was that was some that was crazy. It yeah. was. Is there anything we've talked about the good? What about the opposite side? Any bad things this year? Anything that you wish that would be changed or that you hope that we don't remember when we look back at this season? Um 
I don't think when we look back, I think I think it's great that we had the comebacks, uh, but I think that we were down three nothing too many times. Uh, I think we played that that match far too often. Uh, then I don't think that we're going to get away with that going forward. Uh, so I'd like to see a little bit more consistency throughout the, the games, like through period to period. I think that that's one concern. Uh, we were the low, we were also, we were the least shorthanded, but our penalty killing wasn't excellent. Uh, that's another thing that I think we won't remember very well. And uh, I mean, the eight-game losing streak, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, the, those, I think the two, the two big things to me, though, are the penalty kill, I think, is one. And I think the, just the way that we had to come back in a lot of we, – we spent a lot of time coming back. And I think we talked about it earlier, but I think it, it helped us get a little spent. See, and, uh, and I agree with you on that, but I also think this team was not built to not do that. I mean, if you look at terrible teams, you expect them to be down 3 nothing. I think that this team was built, I mean, if you look at it, as a rebuilding team, not to be up by three or four goals. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I, I understand that, but it would have been nice to have a little bit more 2-1, 2-2, play a little bit more consistent. I, I felt it. I felt there were times that we weren't as consistent throughout the game as we we could have been. Yeah, I, I think that that's the thing I think we'll we'll look back on. And, and as I said, the penalty kill I don't think was as strong as it could have been. Uh, but what do you think, Matt? But you also have to remember that this team is filled with a lot of young players, and yeah. usually young players aren't exactly consistent shift to shift and that will be something to that will need to be addressed moving forward and hopefully the players can learn to get more of a killer instinct and like right from puck drop right through uh with the penalty kill the flames don't really have any centers that can win face-offs and if you look at most teams like if they can win the face off at the start of a penalty kill that burns 15 seconds by the time it's dumped down the ice so if you can start burning time by winning face offs then magically your power play or penalty kill will improve because of that and until the Flames can find some centers that can consistently win draws, I think the lack of success on the penalty kill will remain. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, I I would agree. I think that that was that's that was the big problem uh, there. Uh, certainly faceoffs, but uh, uh, and the other thing too. I'm sorry, I just want to add one more sure. thing. Is um, I think it was great that we had two goalies. But I also think it was bad what we needed two goalies. I think it was a little unfortunate that neither neither Hiller or Ramo stepped up and really took that number one role. Really carried it and said, you know what, this is my team. Well, I, I, the thing is with those guys, they're both kind of like placeholders until the three kids develop. So, like, I know what you mean, but... <sighs> You d- wouldn't really want to have somebody that is a top-notch guy because they'll at least allow the opportunity for some of the kids to come in and take a job. Yeah, sure, but I, I it just, it, 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 I think my point was is the goaltending was inconsistent this year. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and again, yeah. I would preface that that if we were a team built like the Ducks, I'd have a concern there. We were not, and I think that's something we got to keep in mind. We were not a team built like that. And the reason we even got Hiller was he was looking for a team to have a bounce back year with. Yeah, that's that's true. But do you think Hiller had a bounce back year? I do. Do you? I, okay. li- I like what I saw out of Hiller more than what I've seen at Anaheim the last couple of years. Um, you know, he didn't, as you said, he didn't play the number one all year. But I think good for true living for identifying that might be a weakness and for keeping Ramo on. Yeah. 
You know, he could have said, well, I got Hiller. Let's just, you know, bring Joey McDonald back or, you know, Curtis McElhaney as the backup. But I think good for the front office for realizing we don't know what we've gotten Hiller. So we need the 1A, 1B. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, I mean, sometimes you got to do what you got to do to to win it. And obviously what we had in that worked. Yeah, it did. Yep. Yep. Uh, and goalies are dime, are dime a dozen, really. I mean, I don't know. I mean, unless you get a Carey Price or a Ben Bishop, who knows, right? Yeah, I think it's it's easy to look at what other teams are doing and the way they've gone about it. But, you know, I, I would say, and I said this at the beginning of the year, we had the best tandem um, of the year. I think, you know, we had the best, maybe not the single best goalie, but I still think that we had the best one, two guys. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I agree. And to add uh, one thing with uh disappointments from this year uh i think that the flames need to get better at possessing the puck like i know advanced stats say like the flames were unsustainable but in order to take it to the other team and be consistent and not relying on the other team to screw up as much that will need to improve yeah for sure and again i think that might be uh an uh, issue of young players, right? Guys having to really learn their game and how to do things in the Hartley system and that sort of thing. Um, let, let's start with Matt on this one. Matt, any surprises for this year? Anything that really came out and shocked you? Uh, I have a good one and a bad one. All right. Uh, Josh Juris coming out of nowhere to be, come a good, solid third, fourth line player. That's your, and that's your good one? Yeah, and Sven Berchi falling completely off the map and out of the team. I can see those. Yeah, I agree with both of those. What do you uh, What do you think about those, Kevin? I agree. Josh Juris, I think, was the big surprise. I think he came out of nowhere. Um, I just, I think, a great story. Uh, I any, I think, another surprise maybe would have been. Derek England to a certain extent. I think he gave us a lot more than I think people thought he would. Uh, I don't know if I find Berchi disappearing a surprise. I don't think he was meant for this team. I don't think he was a Brian Burke type of Brad Tree Living type of player. Uh, I just don't think he was he was a fit. Hopefully he I mean hopefully for him he does okay in Vancouver. I just don't see um I'm, I, I don't see him, didn't see him as a fit for what the Flames were trying to do. Uh, I guess it, uh, I'm trying to think of a disappointment, and I, I, I honestly am kind of struggling with that one. But, um, yeah, I think Josh Juris is the, the big surprise, I think. I, I, would, I would go with that. The surprises for me, um, I think Juris, I would count as one. I think the fact that the Flames were able to battle back after the eight-game losing streak is a big one for me. I thought that that was just going to tank the season. I mean, Matt and I talked about that. Of crap. And we're done. Um, so I think that was a big one. And, you know, I think we're forgetting the fact that we've made the postseason is a surprise. I mean, if we look at this team at the beginning of the year, no one thought we were going to be in the postseason. So I think even making it there, much less making it to the second round, has to be the biggest surprise of the year. Yeah, that's true. And it's the second best season in terms of end result for the Flames in the last 25 years. So, you know, only 04 was better. Um, you know, a great quote by Brad Treliving that I heard during the uh, press conference on the Flames site, he said, champions behave like champions long before they are champions. And I think that's a good quote to kind of sum things up like we've been talking about. We've got a great coaching staff. We've got players that are playing at their highest levels. These guys are starting to look like champions. And you have to act that way before you can actually move to that next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So why don't we do a quick breakdown here, um, a little bit about each position. We'll go positioning. Let's start at the back and go forward. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the goaltenders. We saw three goaltenders play in a Flames jersey this year. We saw Hiller, Ramo, and Ordeo. Um, right now the question is around Kari Ramo, and does he get re-signed? Kevin, what do you think? If I was him, I would stay uh, probably for on a one- or two-year deal. I don't think 
I think the goaltending market is really fickle. Uh, there may be some opportunities, but I don't think he's going to get as good of an opportunity as he would here in Calgary. Uh, that's uh, If I was him, I would stay. If I was the Flames, I would try to keep him. Matt, do you think that his price has gone up after his playoff performance? Yeah, I think he could probably get around three and a half to four million. Uh, I, I don't think that the Flames will keep him, though. Uh, I think it, they're more focused on bringing up Ordeo and finally allowing him to take a spot. And realistically, his five-game stint earlier in the year, he did perform very well. So it, it's just a numbers game, and unfortunately, one of the two goalies will have to go. And one has a contract, one doesn't. If the Flames could find some way to trade Hiller and keep Romo, that might be a good thing. But, you know, the Flames don't have to do any work to solve the goaltending issue if they don't want to. But who would you keep? Who Keep Hiller or Romo? I would keep Romo. Yeah. It, it depends. Like, if the Flames could even get, like, a an early second or a third round pick for... Hiller, I would probably go for that, but who knows? Uh, it, you, we won't know exactly what the trade market will be. You, you know, what I would probably do if I was um, true living is I think just to give myself options, I would try to sign Ramo because you can always move him later. You can always, you know, if if you go into training camp and you say, okay, Ordeo's our guy, you can always move one of them at that point, but I would hate not to have the uh, the option. And I think if you look at the free agent goaltenders too, we got like Antti Niemi, Victor Faust, uh, Jonathan Bernier. There's not a lot of top goalies out there, so I can see Rommel perhaps wanting to go on the market, but I think the Flames would be the best if they can, and they're not going to break the bank, is bring them back and then explore things at training camp. Let... You know, let him and, and uh, Hiller, for all we care, battle for the number one and say whoever doesn't win, it's out of here. Yeah, I I think that's – and you also got to remember, too, I think I think Marc-Andre Fleury will be in play in terms of trade bait, I imagine. I think that that, that will be something that will be explored during this offseason, too. Yeah, so uh, – Well, even a goalie like Corey Crawford might be available because uh, the Hawks, they are in a cap – crunch and they have two quality backups in darling and ranta yeah i i yeah so i it leaves me to believe that i think ramo's best option is to say is to stay but who knows right if ramo doesn't resign here then with all these goalies in play what do you think the probability is let's say out of 10 that he stays in north america and doesn't go back to russia or maybe that'd be preferable what do you think matt I think that it's a 100% chance that he stays in North America. There's enough roster spots available that, like, if you look at Buffalo, Edmonton, and San Jose, like, they have no goaltending at all, so he could step in and take the number one spot without much competition. Yeah, I think I think if he doesn't sign here, he's he has places to go. Uh, for sure. And those three uh, are certainly on the top of that list. And I just had another one in my head and I forgot it, but uh, maybe it'll pop back. But there's, I think there's a lot of options out there for him to, to play for sure. I mean, there's really in this league right now, off the top of my head, there is maybe seven legitimate number one goalies. Yeah, yeah I think that's about right. Yeah, seven to ten at the outside. I would not be surprised if Ramo goes to July 1st, see what he can get. But I would also not be surprised if he comes back here after perhaps not being able to get a deal. Yeah. Yeah, he could be a late sign. Late sign. Yep. I could see that. Well, let's uh, let's move up to the blue line then. Uh, good year from the blue liners. We had uh, Brody, Diaz, England, Giordano, Potter, Russell, Slemko, Schmeed, Weidman, and Watherspoon, who pretty much were our decor for this year. Um, anyone, so I guess the, the big questions are around Potter and Schlemko. Um, why don't we start with Matt on this one? Matt, do you think Schlemko comes back? 
Of the UFA defensemen, uh, Schlemko, Diaz, and Potter, I think that Schlemko's the only guy that I would keep. I think that he's kind of like a Chris Russell light, and maybe there's something more there. Makes sense. Yeah, I think that we saw Schlemko come in with such such an interesting style and, you know, an interesting... He he was, he was really upped his game here that I think he's deserved another contract. What do you think, Kevin? Oh, I agree. And I think I remember back to the trade deadline and Chris Russell saying his praises about Dave Schlemko. Um, I, I think that that said all that you need. I think I think they'll, they'll do all that they can to re-sign him. I think Diaz and Corey Potter are interchangeable. Uh, uh, I don't... Uh, I think we can get other parts for that, but um, I still think even with Giordano here, Giordano, I think we still, ha- I, I still think we need some improvement on defense, in my opinion. But I, well, and Matt said this for a while: is uh, the blue line's probably the biggest area the Flames need to improve. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think we need to get a good number three somewhere, and whether that's through a trade or signing. A guy like, say, like uh, Paul Martin or, you know, there's about a half dozen guys that could fit the bill. You know, and going back to goalies, maybe we sign Ramo and trade Hiller for a defenseman. Well, the thing is that uh, Elliot Friedman, he was saying that New Jersey was looking at uh, trading Eric Jelena for uh, some scoring help, and... Jelen as a six foot four offensive defenseman, so it might make sense. Like if the Flames could move a guy, even somebody that you wouldn't necessarily want to move, like Michael Backlund, it would help to address the need for both a physically larger player and getting some assistance on defense. I think the Flames' number one target, though, on July 1st would probably be Cody Franson. Yeah, that would be a good one. That would be my top priority, a right-handed shot, some good offensive upside. Yeah, that would be a guy I would be looking at. I don't think he'll be that expensive. No, no, I I think – and I think – tell me if you guys think uh, this is wrong, but I think Calgary's become a destination for players again. Yeah, especially defensemen because of how they activate their defense. I agree. Um, looking at the roster, I think Diaz is going to move on. I think he'll probably get a better deal elsewhere. I think he's proven that he can play in the NHL. I think someone will probably offer him more than he's worth on July 1st or early July, so I see him leaving. And Potter's kind of that throwaway, interchangeable veteran farm guy. And again, I think that that piece is probably interchangeable but i think the flames probably have to either make room for Watherspoon or move Watherspoon at this point what do you think matt i uh, uh Watherspoon needs to be better and he's been okay he, he's been an adequate natarondack not blowing anybody away he's just been dependable down there and it's sort of like berchi you need to put up or shut up and Watherspoon hasn't put up enough where he's deserved to take a spot. And whether he comes in in September and takes a job or not, that's up to him. And uh, the Flames can only do so much to provide an avenue for him to take a job. Is there really anyone else in the farm that you think could take the job ahead of him? Uh, That would only be Kenny Morrison. The guy that they just signed at the end of the year. And what about the NCAA? What about you, Kevin? What do you think about Watherspoon? He, he doesn't excite me. And I, I just, I, I think we've got a very nice, dependable prospect. Like, uh, maybe I would describe it as like if it was emergency food, it would be okay, but it wouldn't be the first thing that you would take for your shelf. Uh, I think that that should be. I think I I would think that that's a priority that they focus on in the draft is some of the is defense. I think, um, but uh, just he. I don't think he'll ever be like a number one two guy, but I think we might see Watherspoon be the reliable five six guy in a in a year or so. But we have we have five six guys. We. 
Do, do, do you do you put him ahead of Derek England? I I don't. Not in my mind. Well, it depends which England. Derek England at the beginning of the season, yes. Derek England at the end of the season, no. I I don't even know if I would put him ahead of Derek England even at the beginning of the year. They play a different game though. It's one of those things that he needs to bring more to the table to say I am deserving of this spot and. That, and that'll be up to him, really. Yeah, and, he's, and I'm hoping that exit interviews, they told him that, and he's going to respond in training camp accordingly. Yeah, well, I guess we'll have to see. But none of the defense really, none of the prospects really excite me and, or intrigue me. I, I, yeah, I, I, I hope during the draft that they address, they bring in, they address that at the draft a bit. But we'll, well, I guess we'll see we'll at that see. point. Well, moving up the roster then to the forward ranks, um, we already mentioned some of the surprises on this team were forwards. Um, overall, though, I think if you look at the forwards, we had, you know, Backlund, Bennett, Bolig, Boma, Byron, Colborn, Furland, Goudreau, Granlund, Hoodler, Jones, Juris, Monahan, Raymond, Short, and Stage and Worthy uh, guys listed on the Flames roster right now. But we saw a lot of guys come and go on the forward ranks. This was where we saw most of the room, uh, or most of the movement, sorry. And the big, uh, I guess the the big UFA on forward is McGratton. You think he'll be back, guys? No, no, not at all. Setaguchi gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, Boma, you th- you think there's any question that we don't re-sign him? I'm expecting a five year contract or something yeah. like that. Going back surprises, I think Boma was another big surprise there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's... Sixteen goals or whatever he scored. Yeah, you don't typically get that out of a fourth line player uh kevin you think backland comes back yeah i do i well i hope so i i thought he i thought he he was one of the better players in the second round i thought he really i thought he should i think i thought he took a big step in the playoffs this year him and colburn i mean uh yeah they took some bad penalties i totally agree with that but uh i thought they were some of their best players in the second round so yeah, i hope backland's back the only thing that, well, the only thing with Backlund, if the Flames can utilize his abilities, because he is a good player, and uh, you can't always keep all the players that you like. And, like, I like Backlund as a player, but if the Flames can address a trade, you know, they'll, they'll need to send something valuable. And... If you look at the center depth between Bennett and Monahan, and then you got Stajan and Boma, you could get rid of Backland without damaging the team too much. And if the Flames could get a top-notch defensive prospect like a, a Jelena or some other variation of that, you might need to move a guy like Backland even though it would sting. But, yeah, I, I agree with you there. I think Backlund's the most movable piece right now. Yeah, and uh, the problem is that he's only six feet tall. Like, if he was six foot two, then there would be no incentive at all to deal him. It's just the Flames, like, if you're going up against a team like Anaheim or L.A., you need to have big guys up front, and Backlund's... You know, especially as a defensive center, he's going up against the other team's top lines, and he's not going to intimidate a guy like Ryan Getzlaff. No, but you know, I I would hope if it was me, I hope he's here at the start of the year at least, because I I would like to see what happens with someone like Bennett and Juris, uh, and see where they're at before you make that move. Uh, I I did. I mean that there could be a little bit of a step back for this team, and I don't want to put I wouldn't want to put them in a position where that's obvious in the beginning. If you're not sure where Bennett is, I mean he's going to be fantastic, but what if what if there's a step back, right? So I I, I may want to start the year at least with Backlund and see what happens. I think yeah. unless you get a fantastic deal in the off season, you you have to re-sign Backlund and bring him to camp. Oh, definitely. It it would only be if it makes sense. And like if you're getting like a six foot four offensive defenseman or whatever, then you look at it and go, well, uh, it'll hurt in the short term, but what you're getting will help. 
but it would have to make sense. Like, you wouldn't trade Backlund or anybody unless it did. Um, Kevin, what do you think about Paul Byron? You think we see him back next year? I think guys like Byron, Mason Raymond, um, I, I don't think either of them are back. Well, Raymond, year. we got a couple more years on. So you think they'll move him? Yeah, I would be shocked, really. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if they buy him out. Yeah, I would agree with that. There is absolutely no... They don't have enough roster spots. And they have too many good young forwards. It's not fair to the younger players to have a spot taken up by somebody that's just okay. Yeah, I mean, you got to give Furlan a shot next year. you got to give Granlin a shot next year. Um, Going back I, to disappointments, do you guys think Raymond might be one of the disappointments? Yeah. In- He's up there. Like, he didn't do bad. Like, he's, he, his point totals were within his career norms. It's just points are points, and he didn't bring anything beyond that. A friend of mine who's a Leafs fan put it this way. He will be great for the first 25 games of the year, but after that, he will be nothing. And that was pretty much what we got from Mason Raymond. I think we got a really good, solid 25 games out of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's about right. And he played a couple of decent games in the postseason. I think he was our best forward at times in the first couple of games against Anaheim. But that y- there wasn't anything that makes you go, oh, wow, Mason Raymond. You know, he just didn't stand out. Do and you guys the Flames th- do have too many forwards coming up that they need the spots. Is there any question that Drew Shore will be back? He's a yeah, RFA. He's back. Yeah, I think he'll. I think he'll be back. I think he'll play for. He'll have a shot in this team. Uh, maybe an occasional call up. Uh, well, no, they can't send him down. He's waiver eligible, so he's he will be on the team. Yeah, like uh, I, I would say a 13, 12, 13 forward type. That's what I see at this point, but we'll we'll see. I think that's kind of his role, unless he proves us otherwise. Um, and. Do do we have to give Josh Jarris another shot? Yeah. Sure. Oh yeah. Everybody, all the forwards, they all get shots, and whoever is playing well in the preseason and the lead up to it, that will be whoever. That's how you'll build your roster. Yeah. Yeah. What about Brandon Bolig? Is he back? He's got a he's got a contract. I don't think you can not bring him back after his playoff performance. Yeah, he'd be the thirteenth, fourteenth forward. You need the tough guy, and I think he's not like McGratton, who is just the tough guy. He showed us he can play hockey. And with Boma transitioning out of that role a little bit to become more of a a point producer, I think that Bowling will be coming more useful next year. Yeah, and similarly, you got a guy like David Wolf who could play that Bowling role as well. So there's options there as well. As far as the prospects, we won't get into all of them because Matt and I have done that earlier, but the one guy I don't want to see back from the prospects is Kandari. I think his time here is over. He hasn't impressed us. It's time to move him on. Yeah, and the fact is that the Flames are going to be getting some guys from juniors like Kanzig and possibly Eric Roy coming into the fold, and they'll need somewhere to play, and... Yeah, Kandari has to go. Kevin, anyone you'd want to dump from the prospect pool? Yeah, Kandari's probably one. I think it's just I was I was thinking about this today. It's uh, last couple of days. It's interesting. I mean, after those, none of the guys from the the big trades a couple of years ago are really a factor on this team. Eh? Like the Kandari, uh, Hanowski, uh, who's the other Agostino. guy? Agostino. Agostino. Yeah, I. Uh, I don't anticipate that we're going to see Hanowski up here anytime soon or Agostino as well. So, Oh, well, Agostino still has a lot of potential. Like he, I think he was second on Adirondack in scoring, and he's really elevated his game in the second half. So I think I'm done the re-sign them all to league minimums and play them in the A. Yeah, I don't think they're they're terrible like maybe Kandari, where we need to get rid of them. I think you let them play themselves out of a job. 
Yeah, kandari has been a bit of that. That was disappointing because I thought that they, they had high hopes for him as well. Uh, there was a couple of other people I was just going to ask. John Ramage. What's I know that's not forwards. I think it's defense. But what's where's he at? Well, he played well. Uh, he he is not going to be a top pairing defenseman or you know an offensive defenseman, but I think he could eventually emerge as a solid. Derek England ish type guy. Uh, he he played well in Adirondack. I think he he deserves another contract, but if they decide not to, it wouldn't be a big loss. I think we might also see him used in a trade as kind of the young piece going to somebody else. Yeah, I could see that too. What about Jankowski? Oh, he's going to be on the Flames in a couple of years. I think uh, he's going to be going back to the NCAA, but he's a six foot four center that can win faceoffs. And if anything else, like if his offensive game doesn't translate to the NHL, at least he would be a very good third fourth line guy. Okay, because a lot of people were frustrated with that pick. Yeah, it's one of those things that uh, he's not perfect, but it at the time it made some sense because the Flames' center depth was non-existent. I'm more confident right now in the Flames' development program than I ever have been as well, and I think that if, if Jankowski's going to develop, he's going to do it under the current regime. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that, yeah. I mean, if we're seeing guys like Josh Juris be able to elevate themselves off the depth chart, I don't see why Jankowski wouldn't. Yeah, and once he got into the Frozen Four, he scored two huge goals in the last couple of games to bring Providence their first national championship and was pretty much their best player during those two games. So it, points and stats aren't necessarily everything. So we've talked a little bit about who we don't think will be back next year. Um, of the prospects, who do you guys think is going to steal a roster spot next year? Poirier. Poirier and Granlund are pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, like I, I think everybody else is still needing a little more time in the cooker in the uh, in the AHL. Yeah, I think Granlund will get a spot for sure, especially if they end up moving backland. I think that Granlund's a shoe in. Um, I think with a little bit more work over the summer, I liked what I saw from Granlin this summer. I think he'll be there for sure. Poirier will get a spot, I think. Um, Kevin, anyone else you think will be in that group? Uh, yeah, those two, I think, are the two off the top of my head that have a, those two, I think. Yeah, I would I would completely agree. Um, Anybody else, it would be somewhat of a surprise. Like, if you had a guy like, say, Kenny Augustino blows everybody away at the development camp and in uh, the training camp and takes a spot, it could happen, but it would be a surprise. I think that Yoni Ordeo definitely gets a call up next year. I think yeah, that. Uh... I think he's the starting backup 1B. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I think they'll probably tell him whether it's Ramo or Hiller that he's behind. You know, take the job. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're not a backup. You're the the second guy right now. Take the job. I yeah, I think he's gonna. I think he'll be a huge factor. Go. I, I I think he'll play a big factor next year. Yeah, and especially with having Gillies coming into Stockton next year, it, the it, the writing's on the wall for Ordeo that unless he comes in and becomes the number one guy pretty much by trade deadline this year that he's not going to be with Calgary for very long, especially if Gillies is lights out in Stockton. Ordeo's also not waiver eligible next year, so if we bring him up, he's got to perform well or we got to trade him because there's no way he's clearing waivers. I could see David Wolf. Um, I could see him potentially being the last cut out of camp. I think we've seen a lot of improvement from him. I don't think he'll make the team if Bow League's here, um, but I can see him being a late cut. Is Bennett a shoe in in your guys' mind? Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, I think at the very least, Bennett is on the roster now unless he unless somebody plays him out of it. Well, the thing is, is that because of his age, he'd, I do believe he'd have to go back to juniors if the Flames don't keep him on the team. So 
I think he's pretty much a lock. Um, other than that, yeah, I, I think anyone else that makes the team is going to be a surprise. The only thing that I would like to see the Flames add uh, up front from the UFA market or a potential trade is a good number two right winger. Like, if you look at the right side, you have Hoodler, Jones, and then whatever center that we're just throwing on the right side. So let me throw a name into this mix. And please don't laugh at me, but I'm going to, I, I, there is benefits and concerns about this name. Jerome Aginla. Nah. I wouldn't want you. him back. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want him back, but. He, he does fit two needs here, a veteran presence and a number two right wing. You know, from a, I, I have two ways of looking at this, Kevin. I think from a fan perspective, I was always a Jerome fan. And from that alone, I think he would be an okay guy in that position. I think from a marketing and PR standpoint, we have to be in the post-Jerome McGinley era. And I, th- and I think to bring him back sends the wrong message to fans. Yeah, yeah. I think... I agree. I agree. You know, I, I, not saying he's not a good player, but I think it's we've moved on from Jerome. Now, here's a thought. Uh, say July 1st comes and he is on the market. What about Justin Williams? He's a right winger. He won the Conn Smythe last year. He's won the Cup twice. Good veteran him. guy. Yeah, I would take him. I really would. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, Justin Williams would be good. Um... I, I think Justin Williams is probably the best guy. If you look at the senior guys on the market, you got Joel Ward, Daniel Briere, Justin Williams, and Michael Ryder. I think Williams is definitely the best of that group. And he's making 3.6 this year, I think. So definitely, I mean, if we move Raymond out, we could essentially give him Raymond's money. Well, I think he'd be more in the 6 to $7 million a season range just because of the Conn Smythe. Like, that adds like a million and a half. <laughs> so... Which even then, like the Flames, David Jones, his contract's up at the end of this upcoming year, so that's four million dollars out the window, and the Flames already have twenty million in cap space. So if they were to give Williams, say six and a half, seven million, I think it's got to. Yeah, I think you can't do any more than three years though at that price. No, and you wouldn't want to it either. Williams is 33. You don't want him here any longer than 36. What about a Matt Bolesky? Yeah, well, sure. Uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea if you were going with the younger player. I mean, I know he's a left shot, but... Um, yeah, I, I mean, and I think he might... He, he's, I mean, he's going to get his payday. He's going to get overpaid. I don't know how much you want to overpay him, but... Yeah, he's a solid 40-point guy. It wouldn't be a bad second-line player. I wouldn't mind Joel Ward either, just simply for the, the because of his size and his experience. And I don't know if you'll have to overpay him as much as someone like Matt Bolesky. I think Joel Ward might be one of those dark horse guys, one of the guys who might not go right away on July 1st and might be, I mean, he's... He's an older guy himself. Ward is, uh, how old is Ward now? He's 34. he's 34. Yeah. I, I think he might be one of those guys that might be looking more for a place where he can be that veteran leader at this point. Yeah, and I think I think with us here, I think that that's it, right? So, I, I think if we're, we're not, I don't think necessarily looking for a number one winger, um, which I think, uh, you know, uh, I think that a guy... A guy like Ward wouldn't be good at uh, as being that number one winger. I think that if you bring in somebody like Matt was mentioning um, in Justin Williams, he might be looking for that role. I think that Ward could slot in well as a maybe two, three winger and might have an affordable salary to do so. Yeah. Well, I don't think that like if you brought Justin Williams in, I think you would slot him on the second line with Bennett and go from there. And even just looking at Williams as kind of the mentor for Bennett, it might be worth the six million dollars. Yeah, the, yeah, I think yeah, he's he's a guy that knows how to win. Uh, I don't know, is he Can- He's Canadian too. Yeah, right? is, yeah. I, I mean, he could play. He, I would think, would be have more of an interest in playing in Calgary for that reason. But 
Well, like, if you look at uh, some of the acquisitions that the Flames have made, like guys like Bullig and Hoodler, uh, they came from teams where they were winners. So, and I think that helped to rub off on the team a lot, that it's the intangibles. Like, even uh, England coming from Pittsburgh, it just seems that there's that undescribable force that, comes with players from winning franchises and I think that like a guy like Williams would help to bring even more of that Kevin do you think the Flames should uh should have their hand seriously in the Mike Green game if Mike Green makes it to UFA uh I would think Cody Franson's a better fit uh I think Something it just rubs me the wrong way about Mike Green in a dressing room. I don't know why I don't have any inside knowledge on this, uh, but there's just something that doesn't sit right with with me about him. I feel like, uh, oh, I, we'll get another. Well, I got another forward name for you, but uh, uh, Cody Franson would be a better fit, I think. Than I like Green. Green on the ice. I worry that he might be the next foot in the dressing room. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I. I've never been a fan of Mike Green. There's just something about him, the aura of the person, that he just comes off wrong. I don't understand why, but it's the same vein of, like, Phaneuf, where there's just something about him that just, yeah, you don't want somebody that might mess up the mojo in the room. Yeah, well, another name to throw out there that was talked a little bit about in the, uh, uh, during trend deadline is Mike Santorelli. Yeah, I could take him or leave him. Yeah, same here. Like there might be better internal options. Like that's not to say that he's bad. It, he's a good player. It's just it it would depend. Like everything. Um, the only the thing I think that might be interesting is there's a lot of talk of the Penguins being disassembled, and if the Flames, I mean, we have salary cap room. If the Flames might be able to get in on some of those deals, that could be very interesting for this team too. I don't know who'd be available, but uh, there's talk. Malkin might be available. Flurry might be available. Uh, most of their defensemen might be. Is there any anyone currently wearing the black and gold that you'd like to see here, Matt? Or 87. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the only guy that realistically is available that I like off of the Penguins is Patrick Hornquist. He's not the skilled guy, but he just goes right to the net and he bangs away at loose pucks. And I think he would be a good fit if Kevin, the Flames could get him. Kevin, you were mentioning Crosby. What would the What do you think we'd have to give up to get him here? Uh, the Calgary Tower, the Calgary Stampede. Well, you know, actually, you know, on, in a, on a serious note, I did actually say this on, on Facebook, though, that I actually think that this would be the time to do it. This Crosby is the same age as Wayne Gretzky was when Gretzky was dealt. And if I'm the Penguins, Crosby, I mean, it's a risky move, but he might be the mo one of the more valuable. I mean, him and Malkin, it might, this might be the time to do it. I mean, if you kind of think about where the Penguins have been and all of this potential and what they've had for them to have only one cup, I think would be a little bit disappointing. Quite I, frank. I don't think realistically we see Crosby or Malkin here, but if I am a team like Edmonton or Buffalo or someone who's rebuilding, that might be the piece you deal for. Yeah. I, the, the realistic piece that I would say though, is Brandon, Brandon Sutter. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad pick. Uh, the Yeah, the Penguins, though, are kind of a crap team outside of Crosby and Malkin, though. Like, there's not a lot there that's very interesting. So, like, between, like, Sutter, Hornquist, and uh, Peron, like, that's about it, though. <laughs> what would you think if we could bring in Christian Ehrhoff as a 3-4 defenseman? Wouldn't no. be my first, cho first choice, but... But if the dollars worked, maybe. What about Latang? No, uh, the amount of injuries he's had, uh, I I don't even think he should be playing hockey anymore. No, yeah, I agree with Matt on that. No. 
So we, you know, and even Treliving said in his uh, in his exit interview they did with the media, there will be changes this year. You can't think that the twenty some guys that we iced in Game Five or the twenty some guys that are going to be here next year. There will be changes. There always is. So I think one of the most interesting things is going to be to see how this team changes going into the off season. Yeah, and if you look at like organizationally in terms of the prospects, the three areas that the Flames are strong is centers, left wingers, and goaltenders. So I wouldn't really expect the Flames to go out and acquire any from that those positions. But other than Poirier, at, uh, Morrison, and Watherspoon, there's not really any right wingers of note or defensemen of note. Well, Brandon Hickey is avail in there, but you know he's three or four years away. So you could go out and get a player in those positions, a veteran guy, just as a placeholder for a while, and it wouldn't hurt. Like it wouldn't be blocking anybody, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah, I think we might also have the ability this summer to deal from a position of strength when it comes to prospects. And if the Flames really look at their prospects, I know I threw his name around before the deadline, but I think someone like Max Reinhardt may have fallen down the depth chart. Um, you know, we mentioned John Ramage earlier. I think you might see some of those guys who the Flames might say, you know what, if we package a couple of these guys up with Raymond or Backlund or someone like that, we might see them move some prospects, not because they want to get rid of young guys, but because now's the time. And it has to be a fit within this this dressing room too. I don't like to me a Malkin. Uh, I think it would excite the fans, but I just I feel like he would disrupt this dressing room and disrupt what the cult this culture has become. And even to a, I mean, we've talked about again. I think again that would be the same way, right? I, I think it has to be someone that fits within this organization. So before we before we end off uh, this week, why don't we each take a, a bit of a chance here to talk about what our expectations are for next year's team? Uh, what do you expect the Flames to be, and where do you expect them to finish next year? And let's start with Matt. I think the Flames will improve like if they make the necessary adjustments, like Tre Living was saying that they were going to. I think the Flames are going to be a solid playoff team. I don't think they'll be like anywhere close to Anaheim I think they'll probably finish about six to ten points back but I th I would think that they would be pushing for home ice uh this upcoming season and they depending on how the playoffs go they could go to the conference finals they might even reach the Stanley Cup finals depending on who they match up with and how everything goes Kevin what about you what are your thoughts for next year uh I think it's realistic to say that they could be playing for home ice in the first round. I'm still, at this point, not convinced they're better than a team like Anaheim. I think what's going to be interesting is teams like L.A. and San Jose, what are they going to do in this offseason? Because you know they're both going to get better. Uh, I think a team like Vancouver is going to take a step back. Uh, I think the Oilers will continue to be the Oilers. Uh, I think Minnesota will take a step back. Uh, I think even maybe Winnipeg. Winnipeg will be an interesting team, but I, I think it would be realistic that we'll be playing for home ice in the first round. I don't see us getting past the second round next year. Yeah, it would depend on like uh, how Anaheim, like what their roster moves are. And like it, you never know. Like, uh, the team that plays Anaheim in the first round, assuming that they are once again the division champions, uh, they might upset the Ducks. You just don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I just feel at this point. I mean, we're talking and like a few days off at the end of the year here, but I just feel right now the best team in this division and is Anaheim, and I, they have to be the team to get. That we, we need to get past, and I don't feel at this point we're there yet. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the one that I guess is a bit pessimistic here. I think the Flames are gonna ice an even younger roster next year. I think that we're gonna see some of the veterans move out of here. Um, I think a lot of the reason the Flames made the playoffs this year was luck, and I don't think Lightning's gonna strike twice. 
I think the Flames are going to miss the playoffs next year or just barely squeak in. Um, I think that, I mean, we're in the middle of a rebuild. I think it'd be great if we can make it twice, especially compete for home ice. But I think we might see this team take a bit of a step back, which I don't know if it's a bad thing, but I just, I'm not feeling the playoffs twice in a row. That could very well happen. There's a lot of ifs and maybes. Like, we don't know who half of the players on the team are as players. So, you know, I don't think we're going to get as good a season from Juris. I think we're going to see some guys take a step back. I'm just, uh, I think if, if I want to be proven wrong on this one, but I'm looking realistically and objectively, I think we had luck on our side this year. And I don't think lightning is going to strike twice. See, I, I, I can see what you're saying. I think that it's not unrealistic to, to even look at it and say that we would be a better team next year but not have the same amount of points. Yeah, you know I, I mean? can see that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, th- I think we would. I think if we did this show in May of 2016, you say, you know what, this team is actually better than last year if you really look at it. But, but other teams improved, right? So I think it's really going to depend on the off season. But I mean, we could take a step back, but a step forward as well. So I could certainly see where you're coming from. There. Yeah, no. When I say take a step back, I don't mean like we're going to play terrible. I agree. I think other teams, you're right, are going to get more points than we are. I think we'll see continued development of guys like you know Granlin, Bennett, that sort of thing. So I think the rebuild process is going to be. Uh, we're going to be pleased with where we are there, but I just I think that yeah our division might move past us. Plus, who knows how Giordano responds from you know his rebuilt arm, so he might step back as well, which could happen. And I think too, depending on how the goaltending is, um, neither one of our goalies was all that consistent. We've seen Ordeo have terrible starts the last couple of years. I think the Flames might dig themselves into a bit of a hole at the beginning that they just might not be able to dig themselves out of. Yeah, I I mean, I think the one thing that there's there's a couple of factors though that I, I I'm still thinking about. I I think the the three interesting things to me in this off season that is is what will happen with Babcock because if he goes anywhere, I do think it will be the Western Conference. And it's not unrealistic that he ends up in Anaheim or Chicago, by the way. Those are two names that I'm, I am here in. It's not unrealistic that. Uh, I do think Vancouver is going to take a step back. I, I, if I'm a Vancouver Canucks fan, of which I'm not, uh, there's a lot of things on that team that I would be extremely concerned about. And I, I think we're ahead of them, at least right now. I would, I would take this team over Vancouver's team any day of the week. I think Minnesota struck lightning in a bottle with Devin Nubnik. I don't know if we can expect that next year. I think Winnipeg's on the upswing. Yeah, I do think Winnipeg's on the upswing for sure. Uh, I think LA is going to be an interesting situation. I think San Jose will improve. Uh, maybe. Uh, and then, I mean, it's in terms of the... Uh, I mean, I think Edmonton and Arizona will remain Edmonton and Arizona, so I'm not expecting anything out of them really. I think it's going to be a really interesting, really interesting off season in terms, in terms of what's going to happen. I think the turnover is going to tell us a lot of where the Calgary Flames are. But I, I, I mean, I, I will say this. I think, I think in terms of this division, I think it's very fair to say we're the second best team in this division. What do you think, Matt? I think the top five from our division this year will remain the top five. So like Edmonton and Arizona being back but there's a lot of question marks for basically everybody other than anaheim so we could easily finish second we could easily finish fifth it there is so much up in the air and it will be a little easier to determine come september when like the rosters are basically finalized but I think the Flames will be better next year. I just don't know how that will translate and whether the Flames will be the same third period comeback, you know, never say die team. Who knows? It. I think to me, if it's the same type of, I think if we're starting the year with some three nothing deficits, then I will be concerned. But if I see a little bit more two ones down two one tied two two tied one one, then I'll feel some progress has happened. Yeah, 
Like, if the Flames can be more composed overall, like, a lot of their points and goals through the season came from quick turnovers and transitions the other way. If they can start getting more of a cycle game going in addition to that, I think the Flames will be a lot more of a successful team. Let me ask you each a question here. I'll start with Kevin this time. Um, do the Flames have to make the playoffs next year to, to have a successful season? There's two ways to answer this. Uh, I think from the fans' perspective, not really. I think for business-wise, I think for discussions about new arenas, yes, I do. I think in it. Yeah, I agree with you on the new arena. What if we look at it purely from our rebuild? Do you think that we can have a successful year and move the rebuild ahead without being in the postseason? Yes. Yeah. But, but I, I think the arena is an interesting piece to put in there as well because I think you're right. Matt, what do you think? I think that uh, as long as players are given the opportunity to play, I this the outcomes of the games don't matter. And like I've said this last year and the year before that, uh, the points at the end of the year are kind of besides the point. And it's how they play, how they approach the game. Are the players learning? Are they developing good habits and good skills? If that continues and they miss the playoffs, then hey that'll be good for the year after or the year after that it would be disappointing as a fan but it would be a more successful thing down the road i think if we miss the playoffs two years in a row then there's a problem yeah but i don't see that happening unless there's injuries like catastrophic ones (laughs) yeah i i don't expect us to go much past the first round for a couple more years but I'm not too worried if we're out of it next year. I think the 2018 Stanley Cup is ours. Yeah? Should, should we get Mr. Bettman to put the new ring on it already with our name on it? Yes. And then I want him to call Jelen his goal. Well, hopefully Jelen will still be around on the team as a, as a coach then so that he can finally get his name on the cup. Yeah, exactly. All right, gentlemen. Well, I think we're pro- probably pretty much done for our recap. Uh, anything else you want to talk about, Kevin? No, thanks for having me on. I think uh, it was a good show, good discussion. Matt, anything else from you? Uh, no, other than uh, the fact that uh, this upcoming week, starting on Monday, I'm going to begin my article dump previewing all the prospects that are likely to go in the top two rounds. So I have about 35 articles already in the bank and another 25 or so to do. But it, I'll be doing, a, I think, two or three a day for from now till the draft. We're out of the playoffs, so bring on the entry draft. Corey was saying, uh, Matt, that uh, I think people don't realize how great Jack Eichel will be. Like, it's yeah. not as clear-cut McDavid Eichel as people are making it out to be. No, like, I actually would have, you know, if I was having the first overall pick, I would actually take Eichel. So, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Stylistically, McDavid is basically Alex Tangy, but, like, the super awesome version. So, it's, it's one of those things that I'd rather have a guy that plays more like a Mario Lemieux type than an Alex Tangy type. But that's just a stylistic preference. They're both I mean, really dynamite, though. Yeah, I think Boston University has a good record of developing uh, great players. I think that's one thing in Eichel's favor. And depending on when teams go up there, I can see... I mean, you know, if I'm Edmonton, I, I know they can't because they're first overall. But if they weren't first and McDavid was gone, I might even look at taking Hannafin because they need some defensive help. Yeah, Hannafin, I, I I actually like Provorov over Hannafin. So, yeah. But that's, you know, Hannafin's not, no slouch. It's just Provorov seems to be a little better at everything. Well, we will see Matt's articles, and we will start moving towards the entry draft. 
Um, just as a programming note, we won't be around every week from this point on because there's not going to be enough to talk about. But we'll post on Twitter and Facebook when we're going to be doing shows. But as we move closer to uh, the draft in June, we'll probably be doing our weekly draft previews. But I, I think it's probably safe to say that for the rest of May, we probably won't be around. Yeah, it'll likely be at uh, the like the week or two before the entry draft, we'll have a show just basically previewing who the Flames should pick or the likely candidates and all that. So, If you need a way to fill the time you'd normally dedicate to Fireside Chat, you should take a listen to Kevin's podcast. And Kevin, why don't you tell them how they can find you? We can, you can find me, um, you can follow me on Twitter at K-E-V-O-L-E or at A-R-D, the podcast. The show is called Agree or Disagree, the podcast. You can find the podcast on www.speaker.com backslash K-E-V-O-L-E. Our next one is scheduled for this weekend. We're going to be talking about the word camp that's coming up at the end of the month here. And I have, so we'll, I'm going to just tease, I have a huge guest coming and I will just tease you with that. I... And we'll put all the links to Kevin's show in our show notes as well. So if you're listening to this, just go to firesidechat.ca and uh, you'll find the links there. And while you're at firesidechat.ca, we would encourage everyone to take our listener survey. We've been promoting this for a few weeks now. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you like about the show, what you want to see changed, what we can do different next year. Um, we're doing this for our listeners. We're you know, If we just want to talk hockey, we'll sit in the basement and talk hockey. So we want to know what you guys want. So... Go to firesidechat.ca. You'll see near the top links to take the survey or go to firesidechat.ca slash survey and you'll get to the survey. It'll probably take you 10 minutes and give us your feedback. Um, At the end of the survey, there's a place where you can give us your name and email address. It's totally optional if you want to do that. But if you do, you'll be entered into a random draw right around the entry draft for a Calgary Flames slash Fireside Chat prize pack. We've got a whole bunch of goodies for you guys. Um, you can read the whole list of goodies as it is now and as it changes as we go forward near the draft. But please take some time this week, especially since there is no show. Uh, next week, take the time you would normally spend on Fireside Chat and take that survey. And you'll be entered to win a Fireside Chat t-shirt, a Flames baseball cap, a, a Fireside Chat can cooler, uh, Flames and Fireside Chat temporary tattoos, a Flames sticker uh, set, a Flames bag, and a collectible set of the reading give it a shot 2013 bookmarks so that's uh the last thing we'll leave you with matt kevin it's been great talking flames hockey with you and i think this is a season that no matter how you look at it is a, is a success cool yeah it was a great year take care everybody thanks and thanks for listening yeah and we will talk to you guys as we get close to the draft Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.